I was a little different. So was that your um, doctoral thesis? I mean, is that what you've done your... Uh, actually, no. Uh, the, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, oh, Jonathan. Jonathan uh, just wrote, a, I thought, a nice little piece that's going to be out in the newsletter uh, about me. As I explained there, you know, when you're, the Apostle Paul said, when you're a child, you do things that are in a childish way. And when you become an adult, you put childish things aside. Well, that kind of what happened. Uh, I became a history major in college. And in graduate school, I really got fascinated with what's what called social history which evolved into an interest in both social and intellectual history. And my doctoral dissertation had nothing to do with the American Civil War. Uh, it had everything to do with a, a woman's history topic. Uh, as a marvelous dissertation sound to the title, The Status of Women, the Disciples of Christ Movement, 1865 to 1900. But, uh, but that movement, the Disciples of Christ Movement, gave me a chance to see both uh, for lack of a better term, um, the view of, of moving toward equality versus the view of maintaining the idea of separate spheres or separate places for men and women in the cosmos. And um, it was, you know, it, it was a nice journeyman exercise. But then right after I finished it, within months after I finished it, uh, a friend of mine at what was then the State University said, uh, I'm putting together an anthology. Would you write the chapter on uh, the common man in oh. Tennessee before the Civil War? And that led to the discovery of something called the Tennessee Civil War Veterans Questionnaires in Nashville. And then after that, my interest in social history merged with an interest in Civil War history. And so I've kind of, you know, I put Civil War history aside and then came back to it but not coming back to it the way most civil or historians do it. And um, is there a restroom around? It's going to be right this way, sir. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think we heard something we weren't supposed to hear. Oh, okay. Well, in my case, my dogs are out in my library, which is a separate building, so we're not going to hear them this week. Have you put <clears throat> all of this information into a book yet? Fred, I, I muted you so oh. accidentally. So unmute yourself. <laughs> there. You have no idea how many people over the years have wished to mute me. Um, I, have, I have a book entitled Class in Tennessee's Confederate Generation that was published way back in 1985. And I've written probably well, altogether, I've written 85 articles, uh, mostly in professional journals or in encyclopedias. And I would say that two thirds of those articles relate to my particular interest in, in how the Civil War relates to American society, not necessarily directly about the Civil War, but how um, uh, white Southerners interpreted the Civil War, what was the consequences of how they determined it, how did that relate to uh, the perpetuation really of a kind of neo-slavery in America because uh, how white Southerners understood the Civil War uh, had a powerful impact on the dynamics of Southern society and the institutions of not just segregation, but the institutions of class um, uh, in the South um, deep into the 20th century and continues uh, to have an impact on the way people see things uh, today. So those are the things that I've published over the years. All right, well, it is now 2.06, so I guess we can get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the final class of part two. Uh, this, this will end the part two series, but don't forget we will have a part three. Um, when is the first uh, the first date of the uh, part three? Do you know? Of part three is in November, I believe. Let's see, uh, November fifth. Okay, Guy first, folks. 
first one of part three. And uh, just a reminder, I will be muting everybody. Uh, if you have questions you don't want to forget <clears throat> to ask, type them up in the chat and we'll get to them in our Q&A part after, after Fred's presentation. So without further ado, Fred, take it away. Well, thank you all for, for uh, participating in, in this uh, e exercise in, in the study of the American Civil War. We are now at part six of uh, our rather lesson six of part two. Somehow that begins to sound a little complicated, but, uh, but this lesson is one that I devote to uh, what's called the harbingers of the cruel war coming. Uh, a frequent term that you see in, um, in contemporary literature, meaning the literature of the Civil War times, uh, is a constant refer reference to what they call this cruel war. And um, that's why I cut this series off in the spring of 1862, because it's in the spring of 1862 that people begin to recognize that, uh, that this war is going to be more than just a, a little incident, more than just a, a quick series of battles and then everything comes to a conclusion, that in point of fact, by the spring of 1862, it has becomes obvious to, uh, to just about everyone that, uh, that this will be one of the more traumatic events of their lifetimes and one of the more traumatic events of, uh, of American history. So the cruel war is coming and this is, the, uh, this is the series of lectures or the series of thoughts that will lead us up to, to how Americans became aware of that cruel war. Now, it always takes me a second to remember, there we go. In order to appreciate uh, this lecture and lectures to come, let's talk for a bit about uh, a few definitions of terms. Uh, first of all, theaters of war. While the American Civil War would be fought all the way from Virginia out to what is now Arizona, uh, the, the truth of the matter is that most historians, and to a lesser extent people at the time, recognized the war as occurring in four distinct areas. And uh, we often refer to these as four different theaters. Uh, starting in the far west, you have what is called the Trans-Mississippi. And it goes all the way from the Mississippi River, across the Mississippi River heading westward, and, uh, and will take you all the way out to, uh, to what is now Southern Arizona. And that's a, a very large territorial area. And that's the Trans-Mississippi Theater. Typically, we have a reference to the Western Theater. And uh, the Western Theater would be the states between the Mississippi River and essentially the Appalachian Mountains. And then the Eastern Theater focuses principally upon the, uh, the rather short distance between uh, Richmond and Washington, DC, which is about, uh, about 90 miles. And yet uh, 90 miles were some of the most intense and violent activities of the American Civil War occurred. And then finally, a fourth area that people forget is the war at sea. And that war at sea occurred literally all over the globe. I'll repeat that, it occurred all over the globe. And so those are the four theaters. In our lesson today, what we're going to do is we're gonna look at each of these theaters and we're gonna highlight uh, the major campaigns of the theater. Now campaign is, is typically a series of both political and military events that, uh, that have a beginning and a conclusion and a consequence, a beginning, a conclusion, and a consequence. So as we look at the Trans-Mississippi, I'm gonna spend an especially significant period of time on the Trans-Mississippi today, in part because it's often forgotten, but also in part because at the opening of the American Civil War, what was happening west of the Mississippi River in what's called the Trans-Mississippi Theater. Um, it basically determined what's gonna happen in the rest of the war. The, uh, the two significant campaigns that we're going to look at, 
I refer to as the Missouri morass. And, and that's about the only way you can describe it, the Missouri morass. A morass is a kind of a boggy situation. It's just mud and goo and everything else. And, and um, if you're trying to, to work your way through it, you're gonna get exhausted. And so the Missouri morass uh, was an extremely uh, delicate situation at the opening of the American Civil War between April and March of 1862. But, um, but the events in that morass, the events in Missouri, um, had to go the way of the Union, or the Union was in a, a great deal of hurt, a great deal of hurt. If Missouri had uh, gone with the Confederacy, <clears throat> and there was every possibility that Missouri would go with the Confederacy, then the outcome of the American Civil War would likely have been considerably different from the way it was. And so we're going to spend some time looking at what I call the Missouri morass, or the Missouri uh, where everything got bogged down at the opening of the war. Then secondly, there's an almost forgotten campaign uh, out way, way, way out west, which is uh, sometimes referred to as the New Mexico campaign of February, April, 1862. Now that campaign, some historians say it didn't matter a whole lot. I'm of a different view on that. I think that campaign, even though relatively small in numbers, made a huge difference. Uh, again, it's gonna be a Confederate defeat, but had the Confederacy been victorious in its goals in that campaign, and there was every reason to think that it could be, then, um, then the whole nature of the war, and in fact, the whole nature of the world in which we live today uh, would have been different. Uh, it quite likely would have led to an ultimate Confederate victory and a Confederacy that would exist from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And so those are the two campaigns that we're going to examine as it relates to, uh, to the Trans-Mississippi. And then in a, a, a more hurried fashion, we're going to look at the other theaters, to the Western Theater, which essentially was dealing in uh, 1861, early 1862, with the beginning of the efforts to open up the Mississippi River from the north. And um, uh, again, that will include uh, such things as uh, Island Number 10, which is on the Mississippi River, uh, the Fort Donaldson campaign of 1862, February, and the Battle of Shiloh and the Siege of Corinth, both in April, May of 1862. Now here's a thought. Typically when people look at the Civil War, they bounce all over the place from one battle to another, from one theater to another. And, and it, it appears almost like watching popcorn pop. It's just happening. Pop here, pop there, pop here, pop there. So the intent of this lecture today is to help you get a systematic understanding of why these things were happening when they happened and the consequences of what happened ultimately because of it. And then if we move to the Eastern theater, uh, there were two very closely related campaigns uh, happening almost at the same time, they overlapped. And that would be Stonewall Jackson's Shenandoah Valley campaign, which is a incredible, incredible a uh, series of battles that is quite literally studied um, at every military academy all over the globe today. And, uh, and then associated with that would be the Peninsula Campaign of July, March and July of 1862. When all of those campaigns are over with, and in particularly after the Battle of Shiloh in April of 1862, and the Peninsula Campaign that ends in July of 1862, early July 1862, um, the Civil War will have dramatically changed. You might say that the innocence with which people went into the war will dramatically change after Shiloh and the Peninsula Campaigns. And then the fourth campaign uh, deals with the war at sea which in April, uh, which in 1861, 1862, largely had to do with the beginning of the establishment uh, of uh, the blockade 
and the capturing of certain portions of the South along the coast to facilitate uh, the blockade to keep, uh, to keep the Confederacy from getting necessary war supplies as well as luxury goods. Um, amazingly, as much as the Confederacy needed war supplies, uh, there were a lot of good wealthy white Southerners who, uh, who were missing their, their silks and um, their, uh, their luxury goods from Europe. And they commanded a high price because they were brought in on the same boats that brought in infill rifles and, uh, and cannon and other necessary things to fight a war. So those are the, uh, the basic theaters and campaigns that we hope to look at. Campaigns. When you look at a campaign, and a campaign is a series of battles and also sometimes political activities, um, here's what you need to ask yourself. What are the goals of the campaign? In other words, why, why is all this being done? And then next, uh, take a quick look at the commanders, uh, learn something about them and, and how that facilitated or hurt uh, the development of the campaign. Then we'll look at the battles and the related events that occurred during the campaign. And then lastly, as we look at each one, we will be uh, concerned with the consequences of the campaign. In other words, what happened as a result of this? You have your goals that were set out. Sometimes those goals are met. Sometimes they're not met. But whether the goals are met or not met, they're consequences of what happened. And, and ultimately, as we come to, to a conclusion to this lecture, what were the consequences of everything that was happening between April of 1861 and uh, June, July of 1862? The Trans-Mississippi. Uh, those of us who live out here in Texas, that's part of the Trans-Mississippi. And uh, it played a role that uh, both contemporaries, people living at the time, and scholars, uh, not always fully appreciated. But especially right at the very beginning of that war, there is a, a, a kind of violent, bloody chess game going on. That, uh, that will determine uh, the fate of the nation. And we're gonna look now at that, uh, that violent and bloody chess game by beginning with what uh, I refer to as the Missouri morass. I, um, I grew up as a teenager in Missouri, mostly in Jefferson City, Missouri for a brief time in Springfield. And um, growing up in that area, I came to have an appreciation for Missouri that, that many people don't have because they, uh, they, they don't uh, really think of Missouri as a Southern state, but it was a slave state. And they don't realize the importance of Missouri as the Civil War begins. But essentially, however Missouri went during the Confederacy, would, uh, uh, and in the early months of the war, would have a tremendous out, uh, consequence to the outcome of the eventual Civil War. In terms of goal, you might start with the Confederate States of America. What, was, what, would, you know, what did the Confederate States of America want as they looked at Missouri? Remember, there are 15 slave states, 11 by, uh, by June of 1862, one have left the union, but that still leaves four. Maryland, which if Maryland had gone to the Confederacy would have meant that the United States would have had to move out of its capital and locate a capital somewhere else. Uh, Maryland was uh, absolutely taken over uh, rather high handedly by the Lincoln administration uh, to keep it from going into the union. Uh, Lincoln had no choice but to do it that way. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Delaware, which was a slave state, was never in any serious danger of, uh, of leaving the Union. Slavery was virtually dead there as an institution, even though it was still legal, and about 2% of the population was slave, 5% of the population was black. On the other hand, Kentucky and Missouri, 
Kentucky and Missouri. Uh, however, those two states went uh, would dramatically, dramatically alter the dynamics of the war. If Missouri and Kentucky had joined the Confederacy, then the beginning of the war in terms of the conquest of the South, if it was even possible to con conquer the South, would have had to have begun north of the Ohio River and would have required the, uh, uh, the very difficult effort to, uh, to secure Missouri and Kentucky. And the real key here was not Kentucky, but Missouri. Uh, in other words, whatever direction Missouri took, Kentucky was likely to follow. And so we wanna focus on now on the events in Missouri and to see how for the Lincoln administration, uh, Missouri posed a serious problem in the opening year of the American Civil War. Uh, what the Confederacy wanted was uh, control of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. If Missouri fell into the Union, both the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers would be virtually controlled by the Confederacy all the way up at least to, Jefferson, uh, to, to St. Louis. So why is that important? It's important for a lot of reasons. First of all, St. Louis itself. The Gateway Arch, probably many of the people that are sharing this lecture today have been seeing the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. And when you see that, you, you think, well, why is it there? Why do you have this huge celebration of this magnificent arch? And of course, when you attend uh, the museum that's associated with it, they talk about uh, St. Louis as being the gateway to the West. That's where Jefferson's bar barracks was. And Jefferson's barracks was uh, the largest supply depot for the entire United States military. It supplied all of the guns, all of the uniforms, all of the rations, everything associated with uh, what a military needs uh, to the forts that uh, would exist out uh, along the Missouri River and its tributaries, which means all the way out to the Rocky Mountains. Now, if that's in Confederate hands, the Confederacy takes possession of uh, Jefferson Barracks with all of its rifles and ammunition and supplies. And even if it doesn't do that, it still controls that avenue, which means it would be virtually impossible for, uh, for the United States of America to communicate with and to supply its forces uh, moving toward the headwaters of the uh, Missouri River moving toward places like uh, uh, Denver and, uh, and Wyoming and Montana and, and further south to places like uh, Arizona and New Mexico. All of those areas would be severely cut off from supplies if Missouri should go to the Confederacy. And then when you look at this then, Missouri then is a very strategic place that has the ability because of where it's located and the things that exist there of making it extremely difficult for the North to win the American Civil War. So if those are the goals of the CSA, you can pretty well imagine that the goals of the Confederacy are gonna be pretty much, I mean, of the United States are gonna be pretty much the same. Keep Missouri loyal to the Union. Keep control of both the Missouri River and, uh, and the Mississippi River. And you'll notice um, uh, the existence of a little community called Rolla, R-O-L-L-A, Rolla. Uh, Rolla uh, happened to be highly strategic in the Civil War because it was the terminus of a railroad. And because it was a terminus on the railroad, it's right on the edge of the Ozark Mountains. Um, it became the main Union supply base to, uh, to try to invade uh, Arkansas. Uh, by way of Springfield, Missouri. And so controlling the rivers and controlling the railroads in Missouri is gonna be very important to, uh, to the Union. And, um, and also it's important because it's from here, from St. Louis and from Cairo, Illinois, which is just on the other side of the river. And by the way, the uh, Egyptians always mispronounce it. They call it Cairo. But uh, for those of us in the know, uh, know that it's Cairo, Missouri. And, uh, and Cairo becomes the Union 
uh, supply base leading to the Union March down the Mississippi River. But if Missouri goes to the Union, uh, Confederacy, then there is no hope of having Cairo as the supply base. So who are the people involved on the command level in all of this? And a, and a short statement about each. First of all, Cleburne Jackson. Cleburne Jackson was the governor of Missouri. And uh, Cleburne Jackson was a fanatical supporter of the Confederacy. Uh, he's elected governor in 1860, becomes governor January of 1861. And he has every intention of leading Missouri uh, to support the Confederacy. And, uh, and in fact, if he had his way, Missouri would become uh, the 12th or 13th state, and it does become the 12th state uh, of the Confederacy. So it's Cleburne Jackson's goal to bring Missouri into the Confederate States of America, and he will do everything he can, uh, some of it uh, uh, politically okay, and some of it, uh, well, in essence, uh, he's not above using the military to produce a coup d'etat if necessary. And supporting that military for him uh, was his ally, Sterling Price. Eventually, Sterling Price is going to be one of the better generals of the Trans-Mississippi region. Um, he had a pretty good sense of military, what the military could do and couldn't do. Uh, initially during the war, as we will see, he has frustration. And the frustration is that he's in the command of uh, Missouri State Guard. And we'll talk about the Missouri State Guard in a moment but uh, it was not the finest fighting force that one could, uh, could have. Remember from the last week's lecture, we're fighting this war with amateurs. We're fighting this war with people who at best have militia experience, but really have no concept of what it takes to fight a war and often not even the right kind of equipment to, uh, to fight the war. And the initial troops under Sterling Price uh, were poorly trained, and even worse, uh, were they supplied. And so uh, Sterling Price will have difficulty, but uh, given what he had to work with, he did amazingly well during this first year of the war when Missouri was hanging in the balance. Part of the problem that uh, Sterling Price will face is a, is a human being and uh, one of his allies a man by the name of uh, Benjamin McCulloch, or Ben McCulloch. Uh, McCulloch was um, a Texan and um, fought in the, in the uh, Texas Revolution, uh, becomes quite prominent in Texas politics during the Republic period, uh, becomes quite active. In fact, he joins the American military uh, once Texas becomes a state and fights rather bravely and competently during the Mexican War. And then afterwards, uh, he stays in the military, becomes an officer, and is, is competent. He, he's, a, he's a good commander. He's got a good military sense about him. Um, basically, his main flaw is he despised, absolutely despised, Sterling Price. And all of the reasons for that, um, we don't know. My personal suspicion is that the two men uh, simply had an ego problem. And, and neither was willing to give in to the other. Uh, add to that, Sterling Price had absolutely, I'm sorry, uh, Ben McCulloch had absolutely zero confidence in Sterling Price's troops, who are the Missouri State Guard uh, brought into Confederate service. And so uh, uh, Ben McCulloch's gonna play a major role up until March of 1862. And, uh, and there's reasons that he doesn't play a role after that. But uh, part of that major role is that uh, while a good commander, a competent leader of men, a person who understands what the military is all about, he could not, he could not cooperate with Sterling Price. The two men absolutely despised one another. And because those two men despised one another, ultimately the Confederacy appointed someone to command both of them and, and that will be Earl Van Doren. And the Confederacy could not have made a worse choice than to select Earl Van Doren 
uh, to command over ben uh, Benjamin McCulloch and Sterling Price. Why? Because for the most part, Van Doren was, in a very simple term, incompetent. Later in the war, when he's given a smaller command, when, uh, when he just has to focus on being a cavalry commander and that's it, he does a pretty decent job. But early in the war, he's given command of armies and there were a few things he didn't understand. He didn't understand paperwork, he didn't understand tactics, and he didn't understand diplomacy. Uh, you put all those things together and um, in 1861, especially in uh, uh, early 1862, March, uh, Van Doren is one of the best assets, a Confederate general, and he's one of the best assets that the Union will have. So those are the con Confederate commanders. On the other hand, as we look at the Missouri morass, um, there are three people who are important. One is uh, incredibly competent, a man that uh, I have a great deal of admiration for in terms of being a man of action, and that's Nathaniel Lyon. Uh, at the opening of the Civil War, Nathaniel Lyon has uh, just been appointed to be uh, third in command at uh, Jefferson's Barracks in St. Louis. He's, he's, he's regular army and officer. Uh, he um, has a tremendous military sense. But like I said, he's third in command. In other words, uh, ranked third among all the officers at, uh, at Jefferson's Barracks. On the other hand, he's... Uh, a, a fervent abolitionist. In other words, he, uh, he embraces the Civil War and uh, he embraces a war against the South and against slavery with a great intensity. And in fact, between the election of Lincoln in November of 1860 and the beginning of the morass that will occur in Missouri, leading up to the, uh, the open events that we're gonna look at, um, on his own, and anticipating a possible conflict, he begins to train local Germans in St. Louis. St. Louis has a tremendously large German population, mostly immigrants from uh, uh, the early 1850s. And uh, so while he is in command of regular army uh, troops, at the same time, he's uh, basically forming clubs of Germans, kind of military clubs, and giving them uh, basic training in, in what it takes to, uh, uh, well, to engage, in, uh, to engage in battle. And so he's, he's doing some things in anticipation of the war. He is a man of action at a time when most people were cautious. I'm going to repeat that. He's a man of action at a time when most people are cautious and he will have, um, play a key role in uh, initially keeping Missouri uh, loyal to the Union. On the other hand, you have somebody that looks like he ought to be competent, and that's John C. Fremont. And we'll talk about Fremont. Uh, we talked about him last week. In fact, um, in our discussion section, I referred to him as a, an, an empty shirt. And in point of fact, he was. But if you look at his resume, uh, you would expect him to be the ideal person to be appointed by Abraham Lincoln to, to supervise both the political and the military dynamics of what's going on in Missouri. In other words, he looks good in a resume. He looks good in person. He sounds good in talk. But when it came to it, uh, John C. Fremont is going to cause more problems than he solves. And then the third person of importance is an extremely colorless individual. The kind of person I suspect if he was in the room with us right now might not be noticed. And that's gonna be Samuel R. Curtis. Uh, Curtis will play a role with the union. Uh, he'll have some success, uh, but he will in the end uh, be less than what uh, Abraham Lincoln and the union desired in terms of a commander. So those are the principal people in this Missouri morass. And before we look at what happened in Missouri, I wanna introduce you to two groups of people. 
And these two groups of people are the Missouri State Guard, that's gonna be pro-Confederate, and what becomes known as the Missouri Volunteers, and they're gonna be pro-Union. The Missouri State Guard and the Missouri Volunteers. The State Guard, Confederate, the Missouri Volunteers, pro-Union. Well, I've already given you a bit of a clue about them, but uh, the Missouri State Guard is just basically the Missouri Militia. And like militia, whether you're talking about Connecticut and New Hampshire, or you're talking about Mississippi and Louisiana, um, the militia was Jeffersonian. Jefferson's idea of the citizen soldiers to be, to be called up when necessary. And, um, and Jefferson, this marvelous idealist, had absolutely no clue as to how incompetent militia could be because the militia were poorly trained, often poorly armed, and, um, and certainly, uh, even though they had been taught how to, how to march, how to fire their weapons, somewhat in unison, uh, the first time they saw a battle, uh, they, uh, they could easily be defeated because they simply were not prepared. They weren't prepared mentally. They weren't prepared in terms of training. And, um, uh, and that would be the case. And the Missouri State Guard will be a classic example of that. The one thing the Missouri State Guard had going for them, however, was enthusiasm. They were highly enthusiastic. And then secondly, there were a lot of them. Uh, they, they, they would uh, recruit tremendous numbers into their, their domain, and those numbers will make a difference. On the other hand, the Missouri Volunteers were located mostly in St. Louis, uh, and they were mostly German in their ethnicity. They um, overwhelmingly Republican. Now let's go back to the election of 1860. It's the autumn of 1860. One of the things the Republican Party did in the autumn of 1860 was they created uh, an organization called the Wide Awakes, the Wide Awakes. Now this is going to sound more sinister than it was. It's not particularly sinister. Uh, basically, Americans were joiners, especially Northern Americans. They were joiners. And so the Wide Awakes became a club, a Republican club. And of course, when you join something, um, you wanna look like you, you're part of something. So they had a uniform and the, the uniform of the Wide Awakes was essentially a, um, a raincoat like cape, a, a military like hat and um, uh, put together to, to look like a fairly sharp uniform. And what did these people do? Well, they attended political rallies, they attended marches, uh, parades. Before the Civil War, in the decades before the Civil War, Americans loved parades, any excuse for a parade, uh, and Americans did it. And so in 1860, there would always be a unit or two or three of the Wide Awakes because uh, they loved to parade, they loved to show off their uniforms, they loved to have a sense of male bonding to one another. And um, it was a social club, okay? A social club with military-like uniforms. However, in St. Louis, um, General Lyons, not General Lyons, who was Captain Lyons at the time, Captain Lyons, uh, who was an abolitionist, and abolitionism was popular among the wide awakes, he saw this as an opportunity to, uh, to go just a bit beyond what the Republicans were doing. And so in St. Louis, companies of wide awakes who normally spent their time basically having meetings and consuming prodigious amounts of alcohol, uh, but they also came together and he began to show them not just how to march, but how to, uh, to line up in military fashion, how to load their weapons, how to uh, uh, engage in simple maneuvers so that when Lyons needed a military to accomplish what he needed to do early in the war. Uh, he had at his possession uh, several companies of regular army and regular army was very good. And then supplementing that re regular army were fairly decently trained and enthusiastic companies of Germans that now became the first, second and third Missouri volunteers 
uh, all of which had grown out of these Republican clubs called the Wide Awakes. And so th these are the people, commanders and the essential military folks that are going to be part of this morass, this, this gummy situation that develops in, in, uh, in bloody Missouri during 1861, 1862. So let's lead you through the events. Uh, and it begins politically. In February, 1861, the Missouri legislature meets and uh, Jackson proposes that the Missouri legislature adopt a secession ordinance. And enough people were pro-slave that that was a real possibility. The problem for Jackson was that uh, a majority of Southern slaveholders in Missouri, Missouri slaveholders, uh, did not want to fight a war. They were what we would call uh, provisional unionist. That is to say, uh, like the followers of John Bell in the presidential election, they were people who wanted to stay in the union, uh, not fight a war, but also preserve slavery. And so what the Missouri legislature did was to, uh, to kind of uh, reach a halfway compromise. It didn't secede, but it also said, we will give no aid to, to the federal government. Missouri will be essentially neutral. Now, Kentucky went a step further and declared neutrality. Missouri basically set a policy of neutrality with actually, without actually calling it such. In essence, then, the Missouri legislature in February took a wait and see at, uh, attitude. Let's see where all of this is leading. If it starts leading us toward uh, freeing blacks, if it starts leading to the end of slavery, <clears throat> then we'll reconsider. And that reconsider may very well be joining the Confederate States of America. And so this presents Lincoln with a problem. Uh, Missouri is tittering. It's gonna go one way or the other. And everything you do in Missouri is going to have to be taken into consideration that uh, you don't want Missouri to go with the Confederacy and everything you do just might trip Missouri into doing it. And that's after February of 1861. Under these circumstances, uh, Governor Jackson felt comfortable uh, using the militia to, uh, to help kind of move Missouri uh, towards secession. And so he called up the Missouri State Guard. He put Sterling Price in charge of it. And um, just as was happening in the deeper South, uh, he began to try to control the federal arsenals. In fact, in far Western Missouri, which is now part of Kansas City, Kansas City is post-Civil War. But uh, in Liberty, Missouri, which was a small community, there was a small federal arsenal and the Missouri State Guard simply took it over and got uh, a fairly decent amount of, of arms, not enough to, to, to significantly improve the quality, but, um, but they got a few hundred rifles and, uh, and uniforms and of course food and other supplies. But the real goal, the real goal was to take over Jefferson's barracks in, uh, in St. Louis where the arch is right now. Now, if they did that, they were looking at some 30,000 stands of rifles. They were looking at uh, food, ammunition, cannon, because this was the major supply base for everything the American military did out West. Now, the problem for the Union and the problem for Lincoln was the two men in charge, in other words, the commander and his assistant commander, uh, were cautious men. They began to negotiate with the Missouri State Guard to find some way to, to kind of pacify the Missouri State Guard and to pacify, to let the, the legislature in Jefferson City know that, uh, that they had no intention of engaging in, in warfare. And uh, for Lincoln, this was uh, highly dissatisfactory. Something had to happen in Missouri. And uh, Lincoln was very frustrated 
with the real possibility that his first and second command would, uh, uh, by intent or by just simply default, allow the Missouri State Guard to get control of this significant and important military base that uh, in turn would have a, a terrible impact on how the war was going to be prosecuted. Under those circumstances, uh, as you get toward uh, uh, the spring, Lincoln in frustration finally uh, dismisses the first and second in command and he makes Nathaniel Lyon, the new commander, and Nathaniel Lyon was in no mood to compromise with the Missouri State Guard, which leads us to the first major violence in Missouri. On May 10th, 1861, Lyon arrest, arrested uh, several hundred members of the Missouri State Guard because he had very good information that they were ready to uh, to basically try to take over, physically take over um, uh, Jefferson's barracks. Now, that arresting by itself might have caused a problem. And in fact, it did cause a problem. As those arrested Missouri State Guard members were being marched into uh, St. Louis, a pro-secessionist, a pro-slave, a pro-Confederate mob forms and uh, begins to shout things, begins to throw rocks and, and sticks and the content of outhouses um, toward, uh, toward the Missouri Volunteers. Uh, the, the Missouri State Guard was being guarded by, um, uh, by the German Volunteers. At that point, someone fired a weapon. It's one of those things in history. Nobody knows for sure who fired the weapon. They don't know if it was uh, the Confederates, or not Confederates, but the pro-secessionist or uh, the pro-unionist, but a weapon was fired. Think about it. In the American Revolution, that's exactly what happened in Lexington. In 1970, that's exactly what happened at Kent State University. And so all of a sudden, the Missouri State Guard fires into the mob. And by the time the slaughter is over with, there are 28 civilian deaths and over 100 civilian wounded. 28 civilian deaths and 100 civilians wounded. What does that do? Think about it. What does that do? And the answer is it upsets people. All of a sudden now violence has occurred. How do you respond to that violence? Now, that's on May 10th. On May 11th in Jefferson City, having received by telegraph the information of what happened, the Missouri legislature still doesn't, uh, doesn't go for the Confederacy, it doesn't secede. But what it does do is to pass legislation giving Cleburne Jackson, the governor, virtually dictatorial powers and authorizing the Missouri State Guard to resist to resist. And what were they going to resist? They were going to resist invasion, by which they meant the United States Army, and they were going to resist people committing treason, by which they meant the, uh, the former wide awakes, now the Missouri Volunteers. At this point, Nathaniel Lyon becomes that man of action. As soon as he can secure things in St. Louis, he gets on a steamboat with a, a combination of regular United States troops, about 1,700, uh, all total, and Missouri volunteers, combination of Missouri volunteers and, and regular troops. And they're on steamboats and they're paddling their way up to Jefferson City. Sterling Price and Governor Jackson realize uh, that, <clears throat> that if Lyon landed, they could not preserve, they could not protect Jefferson City. And so they retreated about 40 miles upstream to a little place called Boonville, Missouri. And um, were there about two days before Lyon got to Jefferson City. Two days later, on uh, June 17, Lyon, again, with uh, his troops on board steamboats, lands just south of uh, Boonville. 
and he attacks the Confederate State Guard. Now at this point, uh, Sterling Price should have commanded, but unfortunately for him, um, he was severely ill, incapacitated ill. I don't know what happened. It could have been anything from dysentery to, uh, uh, to the flu, but he, he simply could not participate. And so his second in command, John S. Marmaduke, uh, commands the, the, the Southern forces, the Missouri State Guard. It's a very short battle, lasts about 30 minutes. You have the untrained Missouri State Guard, and you have the, um, uh, the highly trained regulars, including artillery, a few artillery pieces, versus uh, uh, a combination of regular United States troops plus the somewhat trained Missouri volunteers. In a very sharp little battle in which both sides lost five men killed, uh, the Missouri State Guard collapsed. About 500 of them were uh, taken prisoner and paroled and, um, and the battle comes to an end. But it was one of the most important battles of the Civil War. I repeat that. It's one of the most important battles of the Civil War. Why is it important? Because this man of action, Nathaniel Lyon, in this battle, bought time for the Unionists to, uh, to, to pull their forces together. And it kept Missouri from immediately leaving the Union. And with Missouri not leaving the Union at that time, um, the Civil War then uh, would not have to begin from somewhere north of St. Louis. Nathaniel Lyon, fascinating man, wish we had time to talk about him, um, was quite a character, uh, enthusiastic, leadership type, uh, had his peculiarities, he loved mustard, and when I say he loved mustard, uh, you would have thick pieces of bread, thick pieces of meat, and more mustard than you can imagine, so that uh, his beard, he had a beard, and the beard of all of his officers uh, basically were stained yellow. Um, Lyon begins to pursue Sterling Price down into southwest Missouri to the Springfield area. And, um, and again, the situation is that Lyon is commanding fairly decently trained troops with good leadership. And Sterling Price is trying to, uh, has about the same number of troops for the Missouri State Guard. And, and these men are poorly trained, poorly, poor in morale and, uh, and abysmal weapons. But coming up from Arkansas to assist is Ben McCulloch. And in uh, August, McCulloch and Sterling Price combined their forces and attack Lyon at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. The battle lasts about, uh, about four hours. Uh, it's a very sharp battle. With the amount of time involved, one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War uh, because it only lasted about four hours. And ultimately, even though Lyon had uh, less than half the troops that the combined army of, of uh, McCulloch and Sterling Price had, uh, Lyon had every reason to believe he could, he could beat them because he had the better quality troops. Um, what prevented him from beating them was quite simple. Uh, in leading a charge, trying to, uh, to basically uh, say to the Confederates, you don't wish to be here, uh, he's shot in the chest and within an hour or so expires. And that's the end of what was potentially one of the better generals of the American Civil War. At that point, uh, the Union forces kind of lose, uh, lose their enthusiasm. They retreat and retreat in good order, but they leave Springfield and make their way back to the very secure base at Rolla and, uh, and leave much of the state of Missouri open to, uh, to the combined forces of McCulloch and, uh, and Sterling Price. At that point, it looks as if Missouri is going to be a Confederate state. But here again, fate intervenes. And the fate that intervened was that McCulloch and Lyon learned that uh, McCulloch and Sterling Price learned that they could not cooperate with one another. Um, uh, McCulloch in particular looked at that Missouri State Guard and he did not want to depend on them because 
uh, as far as he was concerned, at any critical point in the battle, uh, they would disappear and he'd be left hanging in the wind. So quite literally, McCulloch returned to Arkansas. What happens next? Well, what happens next is political, and then we'll get back to military. The political involves John C. Fremont. Abraham Lincoln believed he needed to have a man that understood politics and understood the military and uh, to take over Missouri, especially after the death of Lyon. And um, Fremont fit the bill. Politician, first Republican ever to run for president, a military man uh, who, who was famous because his wife had written all those reports and then saw to that they were published. He had a father-in-law who was a senator and had a lot to do with the military, got him all the prime positions. And he was ranked number three I'm sorry, number four. He was ranked number four among all the military men in the United States. And Lincoln, thinking that this was the ideal man, could not have been more wrong. Um, this political figure, John C. Fremont, becomes the commander in Missouri in August, about the same time that uh, uh, Lyon was killed. And one of the first things that he does is issue an emancipation proclamation saying that this war is about slavery, it's about treason, and everybody that's committing treason are going to forfeit their slaves. And uh, <clears throat> that's exactly what Lincoln didn't need. Lincoln had Kentucky and Missouri who were on the edge. And Kentucky and Missouri were filled with, with slave owners they didn't want a war because they saw the war as a threat to slavery. But once they realized that uh, the war is going to be about slavery, then, uh, then they'll switch and they'll support the Confederacy. And so Lincoln all of a sudden found himself in a really bad political dilemma. Lincoln favored the end of slavery. Lincoln's support favored the end of slavery. But to make that a point uh, of action the first year, invited Missouri and Kentucky to leave. And so for the next several months, Lincoln tries to get Fremont to, to modify his orders, to modify what's going on. They fight back and forth. And as they fight back and forth, support for the Confederacy grows in Missouri by leaps and bounds. So much so that uh, Price, on his own now, uh, takes some 7,000 troops and heads north to uh, uh, area not too far from where Kansas City is now to, uh, to Lexington, Missouri, right on the, on the Missouri River. And he's gonna try to shut off the uh, Missouri River to, to, to the north. And he, he besieges a small contingency of about 3,000 Union troops. And after several days siege, forces them to surrender. And meanwhile, Recruits are coming in to the Missouri Guard like crazy. Uh, Price starts with 7,000 soldiers, and by the end of the siege, he has 15,000 soldiers. And it looks as if Missouri is now ready to join the Union. Uh, the problem, I'm seeing the Confederacy. Missouri is ready to join the Confederacy. The problem, however, was um, regular troops and fairly well-trained troops were in St. Louis. And so even after uh, uh, Price is victorious, and incidentally, when the, the Union troops surrendered, part of the surrender bargain was they had to listen to a lecture from Governor Jackson telling them why they shouldn't be there. Um, and then they were paroled. I'll explain parole in my next series, um, and, uh, which basically says you can't fight until you're exchanged. Uh, after staying in Lexington, Missouri for a short while, uh, Price decides that he's too far away from his supplies. He's too far away from, uh, he's in a vulnerable position and he pulls back to, uh, to Southwest Missouri. But it's in Southwest Missouri, the Governor Jackson and pro-Confederate members of the, of the Missouri legislature uh, meet in the Osho for about a month. And on the 28th of October, they become the 12th state to join the Confederacy. So what happens next? Well, believe it or not, Fremont 
does accomplish something. He sends 40,000 troops down to uh, Rolla, Missouri. And those troops began to campaign around Springfield and basically forces Price and Governor Jackson and uh, the Confederate legislature to, to move into Northwest Arkansas. And therefore the winter, Price and Governor Jackson are in Northwest Arkansas until um, a new commander is appointed after uh, John C. Fremont was sacked by uh, Lincoln. Fremont loses his position in November 1. And uh, the new commander becomes uh, Samuel R. Curtis, a political general, um, but he begins to lead soldiers, Union soldiers, into Northwest Arkansas, where he fights the Battle of Pea Ridge and should have lost the Battle of Pea Ridge. He ends up being outnumbered by the Confederates. But again, the old problem of the Confederates were under the command of uh, Ben McCulloch and Sterling Price combined. And since they didn't get along, uh, Earl Van Doren was put over them. Earl Van Doren, uh, incredibly, I mean, bad. Uh, what happens at Pea Ridge is Earl Van Doren divides his commands, Sterling Price and Ben Butler, and he has them march around a small mountain called Pea Ridge and to attack from two different sides, which means basically they don't coordinate. And, uh, and Ben Butler, Ben McCulloch ultimately uh, leads a charge and uh, is dead before he falls off his horse. He was just blasted off his horse. At that point, the Confederate forces uh, disintegrate. Uh, Van Doren is unable to do anything about it. And, uh, and Curtis is the victor. But then what happens? Curtis had never seen, he'd never led men in battle. He'd never seen the kind of slaughter that you saw at Pea Ridge. And Curtis begins to have remorse. And at that point, he, uh, he doesn't pursue the Confederates. He gradually leads forces down into Arkansas and essentially they occupy everything north of the Arkansas River, but there's no real enthusiasm. There's no real effort after Pea Ridge uh, in the Trans-Mississippi District. Well, that tells you that campaign. You see how complicated it was with uh, uh, a morass. The consequences now is that uh, uh, after Pea Ridge, Missouri was never really uh, in much danger of, of becoming a Confederate state. On the other hand, Missouri will spend the rest of the war uh, with guerrilla actions, people like Quantrell and Bloody Bill Anderson and uh, uh, pro-Union and pro-Confederate neighbors will uh, slaughter each other at will. And Missouri, along with East Tennessee, Western North Carolina, uh, and a few other places, uh, become uh, just uh, uh, horrible bloodletting areas uh, from the balance of the war as neighbors quite literally slaughter neighbors. Well, a second Trans-Mississippi campaign of some importance. Uh, the second Trans-Mississippi campaign um, is very short, relatively quick, a disaster for the Confederacy, but yet it shows what might have happened and, um, and is hardly ever studied. And that's the New Mexico campaign of February, April, 1862, led by Confederate General Henry Hopkins uh, Sibley. Um, the goal of that campaign was to secure Arizona territory for the Confederacy. The citizens of um, what is now the southern half of New Mexico and the southern half of the state of Arizona uh, came out for the Confederacy. They, uh, they didn't like uh, the fact that they were being ignored by, uh, by people in the northern part of the territory. And so they decided for good reason uh, to join with the Confederate States of America. The Arizona Territory, which went all the way from Texas almost to California, well, out to what is now California, uh, up to what's called 40 degrees latitude, uh, became a Confederate territory. If Silby had been successful in what he was trying to do this campaign, 
uh, he would have uh, conquered Colorado, maybe even California. And you say that's ridiculous. But remember, during the Mexican War, Stephen Kearney, with an army of 1,700 men, conquered all of that area. So it was every bit of a possibility that uh, with luck and with good leadership, that uh, Silby would be successful. And if he was successful, then the gold and silver of Colorado and the gold of California and the Pacific ports of California uh, might all have entered into the Confederate States of America and led ultimately to a Confederate victory. Um, we're gonna focus on Henry Hopkins Silby, but there's one Union subcommander that's important, John Shivington. And uh, we'll mention him, he plays a, a key role in one of the battles and uh, a much nefarious role later in the American Civil War. Uh, Silvi, Silby, uh, a man of some ability, uh, born in Louisiana to wealth, uh, but he was uh, orphaned, raised in Missouri by, by relatives. West Point, class of 38, he was 15. That was not all uncommon uh, when he joined uh, in West Point. Uh, he had an excellent military career in the Seminole role, uh, a leader of uh, cavalry out on the frontier, participated in the Mexican War, and um, uh, had a lot going for him and uh, promise at the opening of the war. However, something most people didn't know at the time, and it's going to affect him quite negatively, uh, he had a severe problem with alcoholism, and that's going to bring his career to an end in 1863. And um, alcoholism will also affect the campaign that's about to happen. After the war, he goes into exile, actually ends up in Egypt uh, because the, uh, the Sultan of Egypt uh, was trying to provide a, a um, Egyptian army to countermand uh, the activities of the Ottoman Turks. And um, he briefly serves as one of the commanders of the Egyptian army, but his alcoholism gets to him. He returns to the United States and he dies in Virginia at his daughter's home in, uh, in poverty in the end. Uh, Shivington, well, we're gonna talk about him in a moment, but uh, he was a defrocked Methodist minister. In other words, uh, he'd been expelled from the Methodist church, or at least from the ministry. Um, not quite sure why, except that uh, there are some letters that indicate uh, it was because of his pro-military activities. In other words, it had nothing to do with uh, engaging in immorality uh, as we would see it, but, but everything to do with the fact that he, uh, he was a man of, of violence, that he, he wanted to join the military and support it. He becomes a major of the first Colorado Volunteers. Uh, he plays an exceedingly important role in the Battle of Glorietta Pass and later in the Civil War. Later in the Civil War, he participates in one of the most uh, brutal uh, inhumane activities, uh, not only of the American Civil War, but of American history. And that's for a future lecture. Very quickly, what happens? What are the events? Well, on 12th of February, 1861, in the little village of uh, Masilla, uh, the people voted to secede from the United States and then to petition the Confederate government to make what they called Arizona, the southern half of what's now New Mexico and Arizona, into uh, Confederate territory. And the Confederacy accepts them and immediately sends out a commander by the name of Baylor to, uh, to supervise the territory. A year later, Sil Silby shows up and his goal is to lead some 2,500 cavalrymen on a, a quick force across the western part of the United States that will um, uh, secure things. His idea is, uh, and this goes to the problem of logistics, I'm gonna travel light. I'm gonna take just a minimum amount of supplies with me. Uh, very little artillery, I had a couple of small field pieces called mountain uh, artillery, and they're very small. Um, he um, has, only enough supplies to last him for a short period of time, but he believes that he can live off the land 
the Rio Grande Valley, which is where he is, is fertile. Uh, and more importantly, he believes that, uh, that the American military is weak and that he can capture supplies and facilitate victory. It turns out uh, he will be unsuccessful in doing all of that. As for the quality of his soldiers, uh, they were a mixed bag. They were uh, Texas militia. Um, a few of them were fairly well armed. Others had nothing more than shotguns, which means that at a long range, they were ineffective, but in a very close battle, shotguns can be quite effective, uh, quite lethal. And a few of his soldiers even had nothing more than lances, as if they, uh, um, uh, in other words, they didn't have any gunpowder weapons at all. But he's going to try to lead this very quick force into capturing everything from Masella up to uh, Santa Fe and beyond with the idea of conquering not just uh, what is now New Mexico and Arizona, but Colorado and maybe even heading westward to, uh, to establish a Confederate outpost in California. Events. Uh, he comes up against a federal fort, Fort Cragg. And the problem is that the Union forces inside Fort Cragg uh, are safe. And uh, because Silby's supplies are in short order, he can't afford a siege. So what Silby does is he, he uh, finds a contingency of Union forces guarding a ford over the river uh, Rio Grande at a place called uh, Val Valdry and uh, forces a battle, which he ultimately wins. But in the course of winning, he uses up most of his supplies and uh, all that the losing Union troops do is retreat back to the fort and he can't get into the fort and he can't get the supplies. And so Silby has to go northward. He eventually gains a few supplies in Santa Fe, but the retreating Union forces burn and destroy most of the military supplies so that Silby is not able to, uh, to really get enough to feed his soldiers and to replace the gunpowder, et cetera. He then tries to uh, reduce Fort Union, but again, um, he doesn't have adequate supplies to maintain the siege. So he retreats backwards to what's called Glorieta Pass. And there the Union soldiers attack him and Silby is victorious. Uh, he wins that battle, except in the course of this battle, which is fought March 26, 28, um, the Union forces begin to retreat, but the retreat is led by Major John Shivington and Shivington accidentally comes upon uh, uh, the wagon train that belonged to Silby. And Shiv Shivington being the kind of man he was, uh, immediately ordered his soldiers to, uh, to burn all the wagons and to shoot and kill all the horses and mules that belonged to the Confederates. In other words, we're not gonna take his supplies, we're just gonna destroy them. And then Shivington and uh, the rest of the Union forces retreat northward back into Colorado. That leaves Shiving, uh, Silby and the Confederates in a world of hurt. They no longer have their supply wagons. They no longer have their supplies. And they're hundreds of miles away from any kind of base that can support them. So beginning in April, the Confederates begin to retreat and quite literally, they starve. And the handful of animals that are still with them starve. And when those starving animals die, the Confederates try to eat them. And to quote one Confederate, there was not enough meat on the bones to support them. So those are the kinds of things that was happening. And um, uh, it brought an end to that, uh, that campaign. And because of that campaign, the consequences was that the Confederates were never able to accomplish what they set out to do to conquer the West and Colorado and California. It did have consequences. Well, very quickly, let me just line out uh, the remaining campaigns, just so you know what they are. In the Mississippi River Valley, the goal was to begin opening the, uh, the Mississippi, part of the Anaconda Plan that eventually developed. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant rises to prominence in spite of the fact that his commander, Henry Halleck, uh, didn't like him at all. 
Um, one of the problems with the Anaconda plan was the lack of a river navy. But the Union has a man by the name of James Buchanan Eads in St. Uh, Louis, who is a, a mechanical and manufacturing genius. And he will build a Navy in short order, takes a few months. And that Navy will be commanded by Andrew Hall Foote. And Andrew Hall Foote and Ulysses S. Grant become the best of friends and cooperative. And eventually the two of them will march all the way together or float together, depending on what you want to say, uh, to Vicksburg in 1863. Um, you're going to need a Navy, a River Navy. And uh, in St. Louis, uh, the Union cause was fortunate to have uh, Eads. And Eads uh, understood not only how to build ships, river boats, but he knew how to build them uh, so the cannon can't get to them. And he builds several gunboats, all of the same type, the St. Louis, the Cairo, uh, the Con Con I never can pronounce that word, the Cincinnati, the Louisville, the Mound City, and Pittsburgh. If you would like to see what one of those are like, go to Vicksburg, because the Mound City will sink. And then between 1957 and 1960, will be raised and it will be largely rebuilt. And when you go to the museum at Vicksburg, the National, uh, the National Park Museum at Vicksburg, the rebuilt Mound City sits out front. And I can assure you, it is an impressive sight. You really get a sense of what uh, those ships were and why they were so effective for the Union. Grant comes to the forefront. Uh, no one expected anything of him, except for one person. One person saw a spark of, of, of virtue in Grant. And of all things, his name was John C. Fremont. And so seeing Grant as a possibility as a, a good sub-commander who could follow orders and was also aggressive, Fremont gave Grant the opportunity to win the Mississippi River. That's literally what he told him. He said, I want you to, to lead forces down the Mississippi River. Unfortunately for Grant, Fremont said, I want you to make a demonstration. In other words, we, we don't want to risk defeat. But then when Fremont was removed on November 1st, Grant was left with an independent command. And on November 7th, he fights the Battle of Belmont, just south of St. Louis. And although he doesn't win, uh, his forces do behave very well. Uh, they carry most of the day. They retreat in good order. And Grant becomes a Northern hero and Abraham Lincoln notices him. And from that point forward, Grant's career is facilitated by Abraham Lincoln. Unfortunately for Grant, the man that replaced Fremont was Henry Halleck, old brains, considered one of the best possibilities among the American military. And uh, <clears throat> Halleck hardly knew Grant. He did know of Grant's reputation for, for being a drunkard, had little confidence in him, and did his best to pay no attention to him. But Abraham Lincoln insisted on Halleck use him, and he used him in what became known as the, battle, uh, the Fort Henry and Donaldson campaign of February 6th through 16, in which uh, at a point where the Tennessee River and the Cumberland River come to, almost together, uh, Grant has two victories. And the second victory leads to the surrender of an entire Confederate army. 17,000 men, and Grant leads, uh, causes 12,000 of them to surrender, and that is the beginning of Grant's career. Grant uh, is then allowed to advance in rank, given more soldiers. Uh, he ends up uh, at Shiloh and, uh, and is almost defeated. Uh, Shiloh is the bloodiest battle in American history up to that point, 1,600. Americans die at Shiloh. And that's not correct, it's 1,600 each, 1,600 Confederates and 1,600 uh, Union. So that's 3,200 men die uh, at the Battle of Shiloh. And that gets people's attention. Um, Halleck decides to take over Grant's command. He makes Grant a little more than an assistant commander to him. And then Halleck begins to show Grant how to properly lead a campaign and it takes Halleck 30 
days to, to march all the way to Corinth, Mississippi from, uh, from Shiloh, a distance of about 40 miles. But he will march a few miles each day, set up a fortified camp, and eventually forces the Confederates out of Corinth uh, with very little loss because he was very cautious. And, uh, and for the Confederates, it gave them plenty of time to destroy their military supplies and to retreat in good order. And, uh, and Ulysses S. Grant was about ready to kill Halleck by the time that they got there. Fortunately for Grant, uh, Lincoln needed a general in chief. And so he brought Halleck back to Washington, hoping Halleck could coordinate the entire war, uh, which he was not able to do. Uh, at least he was not able to take command. And by default, uh, Grant will resume command, but Grant will immediately begin to see that there's problems trying to attack down in the Mississippi uh, with a supply base that's open to rebels attacking it. And, uh, and that's where you end the Western campaign in May of 1862. For the Eastern campaign, uh, you have the fantastic Shenandoah Valley, which is important to the Confederates. It is an avenue of invasion to the north. It's a breadbasket for the Eastern armies. And it's also a railroad connection to further south. And you could not have asked for a better commander than uh, Stonewall Jackson, who with only 17,000 troops, ends up destroying piecemeal uh, four separate Union armies in just over two months. Um, and the Union armies commanded some 52,000 troops, but they are neutralized, absolutely neutralized by uh, Stonewall Jackson. And they needed neutralizing because Jackson needed to, to move to help in the defense of Richmond, where a very cautious George B. McClellan had marched slowly upward toward Richmond, frustrating Lincoln. In fact, at one point, Lincoln sent him a note saying, uh, uh, General McClellan, uh, uh, if you're not willing to use your army, can I borrow it for a while? And that's a famous uh, note that Lincoln sends. Ultimately, he does maneuver to the very suburbs of Richmond where a battle is fought in uh, the end of May that leads to severely injuring the Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston and Robert E. Lee takes over. And in this series of battles called the Seven Day Battles between June and July of 1862, Robert E. Lee very dramatically and very boldly throws his army against McClellan, forces McClellan to retreat and, and saves Richmond, which has the effect of making Robert E. Lee uh, the outstanding commander of the Confederate cause during the Civil War, but also had the effect of creating casualties that easily equaled the number of casualties that occurred at Shiloh. Now, as a result of that, these two battles changed everything. Notice I said there was tremendous bloodshed at Shiloh and equally horrible bloodshed in the Seven Days Battle. North and South people noticed. And this is why this brings an end to this period of, of the Civil War. Because these battles were so bloody and folks now realize that the war was so serious, all those innocents who volunteered in, uh, in 1861 to early 1862, all of a sudden, there are no more volunteers. North and South, volunteering ended. A while back, and a while back would be mid-1980s, I wrote a book entitled Class in Tennessee's Confederate Generation. And one of the things that I noticed as I've studied some 1,600 Confederate veterans that I had records on was that Almost all of the men, about 80%, had volunteered in 1860, early 1862. 1860, early 1862. And I'd never realized that before. So I did some additional research and I found out across the board, north and south, about 80% of the soldiers that participated in the American Civil War entered either the Union or Confederate Army between April of 1861 and June of 1862. 
after Shiloh, after the seven days battle, all of a sudden mothers began to say to their sons, uh, I don't want a son to go off and get himself killed. Sweethearts said to their bows, well, I like a man in uniform, but I also like a man that has arms and legs and a heartbeat. And so at this point, the Civil War changes and the Union and the Confederacy will have a very difficult time keeping armies in the field. On the other hand, both the Union and Confederate have armies that have become well-trained. Quite literally, they have learned how to fight on the job. Quota. In April of 1862, the Union Navy took over New Orleans and put in charge of the military command of New Orleans was Benjamin Butler of Massachusetts. And Benjamin Butler was one of those fascinating individuals who knew how to deal with issues. And one of the issues he had to deal with was the women of New Orleans doing nasty things to Union soldiers and sailors. If you've ever been to the um, French Quarter and the balconies, consider being wearing a uniform of blue and you walk beneath the balcony. And it wasn't just that the women were spitting at you, but the women were emptying the chamber pots on top of you. And uh, Ben Butler said, that's got to cease. And so he issued a, an order saying that any woman who disrespects a Union soldier or sailor will be treated as a woman who plies her trade, in other words, be treated as a prostitute. And it had the effect of stopping the women of New Orleans after a couple of them were arrested and a couple of them did spend some time in jail um, of uh, disrespecting the Union soldiers and spitting on them and turning their back on them and dumping the chamber pots on top of them. On the other hand, the Confederacy began to call him Beast Butler. And they ordered that because he was unchivalrous to the women of New Orleans, that if he was ever captured, he was to be hanged. And entrepreneurs began to make chamber pots with Ben Butler's picture on the bottom. And so that's just a little tidbit from the Civil War. And that so ends this talk. Shall we have a discussion for a few moments? Sure, anybody have any questions? Any comments or questions, anything? If you, you can unmute your mic and if anybody has anything. You know, it's... Um... I've been doing this sort of thing now for uh, well over 50 years. And uh, you accomplish one of two things. You either put everybody to sleep or every <laughs> once in a while you, you feed them so much information. It's like, where do we begin? <laughs> oh, I know. I was, okay. I sent, me, I sent Misha a message earlier while you were talking that... Um, I, I'm a big John Wayne fan, and John Wayne and uh, Rooster Cogburn's cat's name was General Sterling Price, mm -hmm. and he was and he was a drunk cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Pr Price, I haven't studied him as much as I've studied some people, but everything I gather about Price was that he was a um, he was a good commander. It's just that he didn't have much to work with, especially early in the war. Uh, late in the war, he will uh, engage in probably one of the more spectacular cavalry raids ever. And, uh, and that'll be uh, what we'll talk about when we get to 1864. But, um, but early in the war, he was dedicated to bringing Missouri into the Confederacy. And he was very much pro-slave and, and worked very closely with Jackson. Incidentally, what happened to Jackson was that he... Uh, um, he established a um, Missouri government exile, and it was established in Marshall, Texas. And I think it was June of 1862. It was in mid-1862 at any rate. Uh, Jackson died of natural causes. And uh, initially, he was buried in Marshall, Texas. And then when the war was over with, he was uh, exhumed and, uh, and returned 
uh, to Missouri and buried it in the family plot, uh, which was not too far from Boonville, by the way. And um, so there's some interesting human stories involved in that. Okay. Well, if anybody has any more questions um, or comments. Um, I wanted to say something. By the time you have your next class, our election should be over. And in my lifetime, this has been the most contentious election ever. And my question is, do you think it's possible that the election won't be contested no matter who wins? Uh, let me simply agree with you that, uh, that this, is, th this is the most messy election. And, and, and I'm an animal who likes to follow politics, okay? Uh, both Trump and his followers, and Biden and, and his followers have pretty much already said that, uh, that they'll be suspicious of the outcome. Both, both sides have said that. And, um, and that frightens me, it frightens me. Um, there's some uh, institutional problems the United States has. Let me just give you one that showed up in, in 2000, in the election of 2000, and uh, it's even more of a worry now. We have a mandate, and that mandate is on January the 20th at noon, um, if, if somebody new is elected president or anybody's president, that somebody takes the oath of office for the next four years. In 2000, because that election was... Uh, contested um, and contested almost to the beginning of the new year, uh, George W. Bush, who ultimately won by a 5-4 decision of the Supreme Court, I hasten to add, um, uh, didn't have a great deal of time to set up his administration, which uh, worked to a severe disadvantage to the United States as a whole. I really don't know what the situation is going to be after this election if it's contested uh, by either side. Um, we could end up a situation by the time you get to January 20 that not only do we not have a president, but we don't have all of the bureaucracy and the cabinet officers and, and the uh, associated offices that have to be fulfilled. I've forgotten the number, but I think it's around 10,000 appointed officers. It's either, either I, I, I can't give you the right figure. I, I sometimes the figure 1,200 and 10,000 are both in my mind. So it's somewhere in that neighborhood have to be fulfilled between the 1st of November and the 20th of January. Uh, under the best of circumstances, it's difficult. And the circumstances where you don't know who's going to be president, it's more than difficult. And I'm sorry to be negative, but uh, I'm, I'm very much concerned. Yeah, I am too. Okay. I yeah. think a lot of us are. <laughs> it's, um, it's enough that uh, uh, my family's divided. Uh, I mean, they, they, they support, members of my family support both candidates. Uh, I do not support both candidates, to be honest with you. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, uh, I look at the election of 1860 and the parallels aren't exactly the same, uh, but boy, there, there's some strong parallels. All right. Well, if nobody ha else has anything, that is our time. Um, I thank you all for joining us today and hope to see you all for our next lecture, which will be November 5th uh, and the start of part three. Which is Guy Fawkes Day in England. Uh, <laughs> I, I was actually in England on one Guy Fawkes Day 
And the 4th of July has nothing of what I experienced along about seven o'clock in the evening. I thought World War III had broken out uh, <laughs> and the little um, century old townhouse that I was living in with students and, and Bonnie and I, that thing was shaking from all the fireworks that was going on and the windows were rattling. And I really thought that it was a 50 cal just, just a few feet away. Uh, Guy Fox Day is quite, quite an event. So I'd rather celebrate it in America than, than in England. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you all for giving me this opportunity. And with that, I'll say goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thank Brent. you. Well, what's next? <laughs>